brought Ashley on board here, Ashley Sandy Ford Sykes. Um, a you? personal friend of mine. Um, we go way, way back, and it's an absolute pleasure to chat with you, Ash. Can you hear me well? Thank you very much. Yeah, keep it very well, actually. Uh, good, to, good to see you guys, actually, even if it is a bit virtual. Ah, oh, right. Now, you know, um, most things are virtual these days, yeah? Um, look, Ash, I've, I've, we've chatted about this, and I've, I've brought you on board because of your wealth of experience um, actually working with small development houses, working with indie developers, getting the games deployed. Um, I always like to talk about you and Quickfire, about the ingenu ingenuity of Quickfire. I personally, I may be mistaken, but at that point in time, I do not remember anyone else going, hey, we're not going to do these big massive solutions, we're just going to drive content, right? Just grab uh, games, grab content, and plug them into as many operators as possible, rather than doing these massive platforms and massive player, player management things. Um, and, and I think that worked wonders, and I know that you were pivotal in, in the growth of that. So I want to uh, bring you on here for the next 20 minutes for the audience out there that is looking into going into game design, or is presently in game design, right? I have a, a, a good friend of mine, um, um, personal friend for a while, they've just, they're at a game studio, uh, True Labs, and uh, they have a few titles, and one of the questions that actually popped up a few days ago, irrelevant to this, was, uh, yeah, all right, we, we, we have these great games, we have this like one place that we're uh, hosting on, what now? And I thought to you, I said, you know, just hold on, a few days, Ashley will answer it all. So if I'm looking at a producing, or I have produced my games, and I want to um, get this rolled out, what's the process? Let's go through the process A to Z um, in terms of game development and game launch. Yeah, now, let, let, me, let me see what I can do. It's, uh, it's probably it's as useful as anything trying to do this uh, over the uh, video, and there's, there's so much, um, it's, it's, com it's complex and it's grown, it's, co it's come from miles away. So something that I did oh, a few years back now is uh, mm -hmm. I actually plotted out roughly where the, the industry was at that point for game studios. I remember uh, that. There you go. Okay, so I've, I've got a little slide that I'll, I'll, I'll pop through for this. And it really, okay. it's, it, it just shows complexity more than anything else. Mm -hmm. Well, right. effectively, if we were to roll back four or five years, the landscape was a lot, lot easier than it is today. Mm -hmm. uh, but that game development studio you're referring to there has got a whole plethora of different options. They're not yeah. just producing widgets. You know, they're, yeah. they're involved in, a, in an industry. That's got a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a vertical with lots of different mm -hmm. parts to it. Yeah. Um, yeah. In fact, that's probably a good place to start, actually. Let's talk about those different parts. So everybody thinks, yeah, game studio, it produces games. And to a large extent, that's true. Uh, but depending on their skills and expertise and where there's value, that game studio is going to get its value or add its value into the market in different ways. Mm -hmm. And at the simplest level, um, a game studio is nothing more than just a IP genius hotbed. And there are a number of companies out there that basically yeah. just come along and produce IP. Yeah. Um, I suppose most famous of that really from a casino perspective are all the various kind of table game variants you mm -hmm. see. You, you know, you go to all of the relevant shows around the world and there are people just pitching table game variants everywhere. They've got nothing more than a great game idea. Yeah, It's still a game studio in its own right, you know? Um, and I, I, I just try, I, I've, again, I've gotten a little diagram and I'll try and put it together and show mm -hmm. how you can go from that basic game idea, how do you build on the studio? Um, and the next thing that, a studio really starts to do is to put some kind of cosmetic beauty to it. It's one thing having a nice game idea, mm -hmm. but if you don't know what it looks like or how it feels, then you can't really show it to Actually, the customer. Let me interrupt you for a second. You're talking about a game yeah. studio, and for me, in layman's terms, studio, you know, I'm sitting in studio. Studio means design, studio means interface, and so on. When you say game studio, are you actually talking about the engineering of the mathematical elements before the front Good end? Point. No, it's, it's great. So uh, I think. A studio comes in different shapes and sizes, mm -hmm. and, and I'll get to our typical studio. Mm -hmm. uh, but our, our basic studio is, a, is one man who thinks of some game ideas. That's a studio, but that's all he is. Uh, a two-man outfit is where you've got a nice guy who's got some great game ideas, 
and he's outsourced uh, some of the graphic components. And they produce nice documents that show what this yeah. type of thing should yeah. look like. Game Studio with kind of five, six, seven people starts to include some development so they can actually show things moving. A fully formed typical studio could pretty much do all of that front end web components. Mm -hmm. So that's not just design and graphical development, mm -hmm. that's most importantly things like mathematics, mm -hmm. which I'll spend a lot of time talking to you about, heart and soul of a game, mm -hmm. but also other things like sound. You know, probably one of the big areas not really understood is that sound plays a massive role in an online development of games. Probably not a full time role for most studios. But if you're going to be a complete studio, you want your own persona Clarify as well. Clarify that for me, sound. Sound. So um, if you uh, if you head into a um, uh, a land based casino, yeah, you're just immediately hit by the ching 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 yeah, ching. Yeah, a sound. Okay, sound. I'm going. I'm going. Sand. Is that terminology that I'm not familiar with? I'm thinking beaches, man. Sound. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. The reason I'm giving that is that you know, in a land base, what you're trying to do in a, in a developing machines land base is also to attract all those punters in the casino to come yeah. and have a look at this machine. It's paying I'll, out to make it happen. I'll, 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 I'll add to this. Um, not only do I agree with you, but for, for the longest time, you, you, you know my history, we've worked together in the past. Um, uh, whenever I talked about customer engagement, and whenever I talked about games per se, just besides the mathematics, me and you had wonderful debates on, you know, where, the, where does mathematics play a role in stickiness and longevity of the game? But sound, man. And I will go back to microgaming. And I will go back to Immortal Romance. I will go back to a particular game, no, honestly, uh, where the background, besides the, obviously, the engagement of the spins and the gamification of choosing the bonus rounds and all, the, I used to leave that game just sitting there because the background noise, was so um, calming, right? And it was so um, immersive where I could just leave it roll and roll. It wasn't intrusive, but yet when I played that game, which was incredible for me, that same calming sound um, kind of took front, front, front and center in my uh, oral auditory uh, universe. Yeah, and, and, yeah. and I always, I, I keep bringing that game back up because it, it was a clear, uh, example for me how sound does have incredible influence on on game perception me, and longevity. I'll give you a bit of background around uh, Immortal Romance and that particular type of sound as well but we'll also mm -hmm. we'll lead that on to the role of producing in mm -hmm. games which is far more encompassing is that you know that that land based casino is going ching 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 mm -hmm. is great yeah. but if you try and imagine who our typical online customer is and the environment that a typical online customer is actually immersed in, there aren't people hanging around watching the screen kind of getting the same ching, ching, ching mm, element. Yeah. Uh, potentially like this, stored away in an office, headphones on. Yeah. Do you know um, the, the I, I dinner don't have is being on, so, no. with the kids. So you're after something that's slightly different. The entertainment value is slightly different. Um, so your sound engineers need to appreciate that. But the reason for me kind of rolling it on yeah. is saying that uh, you've also then got the role of a producer in a studio. Yeah. You know, not just that initial game idea, but how does the whole package come together? And it's the producer that really understands how graphical quality marries with the maths with the game, marries with what you're trying to create from an atmosphere and sound, etc. So you get that overall package of a winner. So if we were to flow this, as, as a journey. So, so from the product perspective, um, we spoke about the mathematics, yes, the, immer the immersion. So if we, if we break down the game design, yes, we have the audio and the visual. We have the mathematics for stickiness, I would say, for the, for the character of the game. Nice, um, yeah. yeah. Um, where do we sit with uh, existing technologies, I'd say, right? Um, considering just how far and widespread uh, game delivery is, are there any engines, frameworks, you know, the flows? If I were to invest in a game studio design today, what's my fastest route to market? Okay. Do, I, do I have to reinvent the wheel? Are there any frameworks and, and precedents that I can tap into? So the one big I think, so if, you're, if you're, I'm taking Igor and obviously you're a wealthy man. Uh, <laughs> 
you're investing in a game studio. Yeah. I'm not expecting you to be investing in the next uh, uh, Playtech or micro gaming yeah. business. Actually, it's something that's on a journey. So mm -hmm. the big cutoff I would say to you is that uh, in producing game and gaming content, producing the server side uh, with its industrial grade um, uh, quality that needs to be given to any server side mm -hmm. results, the level of um, uh, approval of the hardware, management of hardware, the jurisdictional requirements on the server side mm -hmm. and the extra tools like the gamification bit we were starting to leak into there. That's a big chunk of investment. Mm -hmm. uh, what I would say is treat that as something that's already provided into the market. Okay. It's very difficult to reproduce and drive value out of. There's a lot of people that currently do it. Mm -hmm. um, a successful company will, will take a part of that market, but it's very hard to get into. Does that make sense? Yeah, very much so. It's a really interesting take, man. Very. All right, so, so fine. We've went through the flow. We're producing. There's something I want to tell you, though. You've mentioned early, early on. We just started chatting, and we're talking about uh, Immortal Romance and the, the calmness of the background music, and we're talking about audio. Um, there was a fantastic research paper done, and now I'm afraid of misquoting. I believe it's a professor of psychology at Stanford, but I may be wrong, right? I may be wrong. I can't remember the university exactly. It was a woman, and um, I'll, I'll see whether we can, when we produce this and post this, whether we can add it in comments or something to the actual research paper. But she analyzed um, what, what we currently do uh, psychologically um, as a society. So in the past, if you roll back pre-Facebook, pre-mobile days, and we're rolling back 20 years, yeah? We tend to reduce anxiety by creating uh, repetitive patterns of behavior, right? So we used to, you know, if you're walking down the street, it, gamifying life, you could look at it as gamifying life, but you'd count the steps, you count the leaves. If, as, as you move around the house, we tend, we always used to tend to create patterns of repetitive behavior. You know, being in the kitchen, being this, being that. Mobiles come on, right? Uh, the screen time increases. Uh, and, and she's analyzed tremendous amount of people um, on their behavior on screen. And she found that there is something called the machine zone, right? Machine zone, where, I don't know whether you catch yourself. I, 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 I certainly have caught myself many times where I would just be scrolling down my email and I'm not sure what I'm actually looking for. I'm just going psh, psh, and I'm just lost in that zone. And um, I, as I was starting to speak to my friends about this and, and mentioning this article I read, I said, yeah, we do that on Facebook all the time. We do that. You just simply get lost in the machine. And she drew a correlation between what happens with slot games and what happens with games. And we tend to perceive casino games as means of excitement and Volatility, high and low happiness, but a tremendous amount of the games that are produced um, are actually used to lower anxiety due to the repetitive nature of spin, spin, spin. And uh, a, an entire subset of our customer uh, segment, I would say, you know, the, I always like to classify as the old lady, you know, time on device uh, player. Yes. Uh, is simply using their experience and playing our games to, to combat anxiety and spend time and calm their environment down. Have you, a, a, a have you come across that topic. research? Yeah, so, sure. A little bit off, off topic now, maybe, Igor, but you know, actually quite very useful to that. I think the, yeah. um, uh, the academic you're actually referring to is a lady called Natasha Dow-Schultz, um, very famous for her work on the, uh, on the machine zone. And uh, you also threw in a lovely little ter term there earlier called uh, uh, time on device. Yeah. Um, and typically, if we were to roll back, uh, uh, let's, let's pay homage to, uh, to Starburst and, and NetEnt here, mm -hmm. you know? Fair enough. Relatively low volatile slots, um, cornered the market for a good number of years in really playing to this idea of what suits the machine zone, uh, yeah. what really gave us time on device. Didn't really know what was happening. The little bit of variation kept you going. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, these days, of course, is that everybody's now looking for a lot more higher volatility. Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen uh, a, a massive uh, input, I guess, from uh, the, the streamers. Uh, mm -hmm. Streamers looking for high volatile yeah, exactly. slots. You know, 
change a little bit of the landscape. And uh, I'd certainly say right now we're looking at high volatile, exciting slots as what people are requesting, as what's actually being developed. Mm. And it certainly suits a small, a small is the wrong word, it still suits a proportion of the marketplace. Mm. But it's also the very high value marketplace. Mm -hmm. And I do wonder how much we'll see that kind of continue so do, now over the next yeah, few years. Do you think the, the angle of, of the the angle of the nature of the game being produced has changed? Do you actually think that the market has shifted? To, we, we talked about mathematics, right? It it is shifted to le, uh, shorter span, more engaging, more volatile experience. Do you think that we're missing yeah. out? That that we're neglecting part of the market, or that market simply doesn't exist as the new age of customers coming on, as the, as, as the median age of, of, of customers is lowering, younger people are coming on board, shorter attention span, and that's simply where the market has taken us, game-wise. Very interesting. I, I, I'm not 100% whether it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a push or pull on the mm. market changes. You know, so mm. if, you, if you only give people high volatility slots, then you shouldn't be surprised that that's what they're playing. So I, I can't really say whether it is push or pull. But yeah. definitely we're seeing a far greater proportion of high volatile stuff. And if you were to you know, look at the hard end of B2C operation, I mm -hmm. think the argument for that is that uh, they feel that the customers are, they're giving more entertainment for the customers. And uh, as businesses, they're becoming more successful as businesses, progressing those kind of slots. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of where it's moving. Are they neglecting uh, a portion of their customer base that really would pander for something a little bit mm -hmm. uh, less volatile? I can't answer for sure. I would say that they are probably signposting their content better these days. So by and large, if I was to roll back five or six years, a customer never knew whether he was playing a high or a low volatile slot. Yeah, he just now, played. Now that's much clearer. Got there. That, that is changing now. Yeah. We're, we're actually showing customers a lot better we're helping them on their journey a lot better these days. Yeah, no, it makes sense. Look, um, we only have a couple of minutes left. I wanted to close off. So, 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 um, I don't have any players. What do I do now? So, one, how do I know I'm ready? And two, how do I get my content to market? And so, I, I guess the, the the two things for getting to market. One is actually getting it live and getting money coming into mm -hmm. into as a business. Mm -hmm. That's getting to market. Mm -hmm. And then there's the uh, the coming to market, how do I sell my business? Um, there's two intimately intertwined questions. So let's say um, my content to market. I want the liquidity. I want the place. So what are my so channels? You're, you're brand new. You've got your friend developing your game. My kind of uh, five things to concentrate on is only produce the very, very best content day one. Don't produce anything filler just because you can do it quickly. I want to do content. Hit for the stars and sell it. Make it mm -hmm. cosmetically new and fresh and now. Um, it's very hard to compete with uh, the familiarity of current people who are out there. You know, mm -hmm. they, they've built the content before, so get new, get fresh. Find partners. So your game has to have great mathematics behind it. If you haven't got it yourself, find them. And then find that distribution. That will only come via partners. Really, don't worry about the costs, yeah. worry about the distribution. Far more important to get a small slice of a big pie than a big slice Absolutely. of a small pie. So the role of aggregators here, I, I imagine it's key. I, I imagine it's key, right? Um, we have we have someone from Yudras. Yudrasil just launched, uh, I believe it's Yudrasil Masters, um, which uh, allows small indie developers to um, to have quick integration into their customer pool. And I kind of, I was speaking to, to Yudrasil recently about this. Uh, we have them coming uh, just after this chat. And it did remind me of that concept of, of Quickfire in the early days. And, and what you've done in terms of, I remember you've had content from Rapcat and various, I forget now, but various small operators, you know, two titles here, two titles there. But for those indie studios, those small studios at that time that maybe had five, six titles, you know, I think going through the whole licensing and whole integration process itself is uh, intense for operators. Um, having, as you said, a small slice of the pie, uh, of a big pie, I think it's valuable in the early stages of game development. So would you advise aggregators? Absolutely. Is there... Yeah, yeah it's anybody who, who can help get your game to market. Now, the advantage of aggregators on the whole is that they've got large distribution. Yeah. You know, there are probably 
six, seven companies out there with mm. very big, large distribution. What I would say to any small developer is actually try and engage with all those six or seven. Most of them aren't going to push you forward very quickly, but better than putting all your eggs in one basket. But I think okay? the quality of content in that case will actually speak for itself. As you said, your first five rules come into play there. Because I think yeah. given, given that distribution, that the quality can rise to the surface. We've seen that in the industry before. Ash. Perfect. Uh, we're out of time, sadly. I could speak to you for hours, but uh, I, I really want to thank you for your time. Your insight is invaluable, and I hope anyone currently in um, thinking about game design or in the process of game design um, has found this valuable for them to listen to. Um, wonderful stuff. I can't wait to hear about your new project, and uh, we'll chat about that as well. Um, Pleasure. Thank you very much, Igor. Take care. And uh, look forward to seeing you at Sigma.